Welcome to the Gospel Attic Podcast. I'm Greg Bryan. And I'm Jim Resty. We're gospel addicts because we believe the gospel of Jesus isn't just good news, it's the best news ever. We're addicted to the gospel because it doesn't just start us out in the Christian life, it is the Christian life. Join us as we look at the Bible through the lens of the gospel. Thanks so much for listening. Letter of 2 Corinthians. It's different than Paul's other letters. His other letters tend to be, he gives doctrine, and then he says, this is how you should live. The letter of 2 Corinthians reads more like Paul's personal journal. And in this letter, he's extremely honest about his feelings and struggles. And I think there's four reasons why he wrote the letter, to encourage the church to bring this repentant brother that he wrote about in, in, in 1 Corinthians back into the church, to explain to the Corinthians his change in travel plans, to enlist their financial help for the church in Jerusalem, and to establish himself as an authority among the Corinthians. But the big theme I want us to think of this morning is the theme of living in light of eternity. What does it look like to live in light of eternity? In the course of my study and preparation, I uncovered seven spiritual principles that I believe will help us to live in light of eternity. One of the best ways to think of this big theme of living in light of eternity is the rope illustration, which I learned from Francis Chan. Imagine your life is like this rope, but unlike this rope, imagine the rope has no ending, that it goes out this church, down 91, wraps around the earth a couple times, goes up to the moon, heads to Mars, and then just keeps going and going. But the rope has a beginning. And let's consider that our earthly life is only the first few inches of this rope. Because the truth is, the rope has a distinct beginning, but it has no ending because we were made for eternity. The temptation for us is to focus all our energy just on these first few inches, isn't it? That's what the world wants us to do. And, and to neglect thinking about the implications of the rest. How ridiculous is this? I mean, we worry so much about this little part, but we forget that the choices that we make now will ripple into eternity. At the end of this short life, we will all stand before God, and all that's going to matter is whether we followed and served Jesus, whether we made Jesus known, and whether we helped other people do the same. The real question is, what am I doing now to advance the gospel into eternity? What is ministry, anyway? One of my favorite definitions of ministry is ministry is making friends for an eternity. Because there's three things that last forever, God, His Word, and people. And so, what I love about ministry is it's so simple. It's making friends for an eternity. So... The first spiritual principle that I uncovered is the idea that we need to live by faith, not by sight. So can I have a volunteer quickly read chapter 5, verses 1 to 10? For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put our heavenly dwelling. If indeed, by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what in mortal way we swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for the very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always of good courage. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord, so that whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please Him. 
for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether for good or evil. Thank you, Fred. Actually, the first two spiritual principles come out in this section of Scripture. And the first one I want to call living with an eternal perspective. And I don't know about you, but I enjoy reading missionary biographies, like the story of William Carey. William Carey lived with an eternal perspective. He must have thought of quitting a thousand times because this early 19th century missionary faced continual difficulties and heartbreak as he sought to establish an outpost for Christ in India. For example, he buried two of his four children before his second anniversary there. Many of his supporting churches discontinued their financial support, forcing him to get a job to work in a factory just to sustain his family. He learned two Indian languages in order to translate the scriptures to share the gospel, but it took seven years before he led his first convert to Christ. Also, his early translations of the Bible went up in smoke because his print shop caught fire, yet he pressed on. William Carey's life revealed an inherent characteristic of great Christians. They never give up. Most American Christians today would have it easy compared to William Carey and scores of other servants of God. Yet we're still so prone to lose heart at our first sign of hardship. Carey did it by living with an eternal perspective. But what if Carey hadn't persevered? India would have lost its greatest force for the gospel. 1,400 would have gone unbaptized over the next 21 years. Bible translations into 35 Indian languages and dialects would have never been produced. More than 100 schools for 7,000 Indian nationals would have never opened their doors. Yet each of these things did happen because Carey, like the Apostle Paul, was willing to persevere in the face of hardship. Carey had an eternal perspective, and his eternal perspective blessed the people of India. William Carey passed away at the age of 72. Do you know what was written on his tombstone? Anybody know? Okay, here's what he had put on his tombstone. A wretched, poor, and helpless worm. On thine kind arms I fall. Kerry lived with Paul wrote about in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. The second spiritual principle that I found is walking by faith, not by sight. What does it mean to walk by faith? By the way, the, the Greek word literally means walk by faith. And I was thinking about that. Why does it say walk by faith? Why didn't he just write live by faith? Well, because think about it. If a person is walking, they're alive. <laughs> you don't see any dead people walking. So to walk is to be alive, right? Well, what does it mean? It means not relying solely on what we see and experience in the present. It means trusting in God's promises, even when they seem difficult. To walk by faith is to fear God more than man. To obey the Bible, even when it conflicts with man's commands. To choose righteousness over sin, no matter what the cost. To trust God in every circumstance. Our natural instinct is to hoard money. But walking by faith says that we should be kind to those in need. We should be generous with our money. To live by faith is to tune our hearts to the voice of the Holy Spirit and the truth of his word. We choose to live according to what God reveals to us rather than to trust our own understanding. And one of the first verses I learned as a Christian, and probably some of you too, is Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your paths straight. So 
The second principle is to walk by faith and not by sight. But then Paul continues in chapter 5, in verse 11, it says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known to your conscience. We are not commending ourselves to you again, but giving you cause to boast about us, so that you may be able to answer those who boast about outward appearance and not about what is in the heart. For if we are beside ourselves, it is for God. And if we're in our right mind, it is for you. And I love these next two verses. For the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who, is, who died and was raised again. The third spiritual principle I see in Paul's writing is this, that we witness to others out of love and gratitude towards Christ. The primary motivation for our witness is love and gratitude. It says, for Christ's love compels us. The more we walk with God, the more we should experience the love of Christ. It should get, grow bigger in our lives. Our awareness of his love. And by the way, it's not our love for God. Because we love because he first loved us. It's not our love for God. You know, why do I witness? Oh, because I love God. No, it's because he loved me. That should be the driving force for our witness. We don't witness out of fear or obligation or to get rewards. The primary motivation is love. His love for us. Paul continues on in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that in Christ, God was reconciled the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 is one of my favorite passages, one of my favorite chapters of the Bible. It's probably in my top 40. It used to be in my top 10, but the more I read the Bible, the more, you know, more chapters you get. So you got to keep expanding your list. But one of the first verses I memorized was 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. This truth is so foundational. It's so central to the Christian life. If the Christian life is like a wheel, then this truth is right in the hub. And speaking of wheels, it's kind of in my contract as a navigator to show you this every time I teach. It's one of the key verses in the wheel illustration. It's right there in the center. Dawson Trotman, the founder of the Navigators, developed this illustration, and he put Christ right at the center. But this passage brings up two more spiritual principles. First, it says we are to be ambassadors for Christ. So principle number four is being an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador is appointed by the king or president. An ambassador represents the kingdom or country he or she represents. An ambassador never becomes a citizen of the state or government to which he or she is assigned. An ambassador never speaks his or her own personal position on an issue, only the nation's official position. So what do we learn from that? Well, we learn that if we're going to be ambassadors for Christ, I think we would represent him well if we followed these 10 qualities of good ambassadors. The first one is to be ready. An ambassador is alert for chances to represent Christ and will not back away from any opportunity. An ambassador is patient. They won't quarrel, but they will listen in order to understand 
and then with gentleness seek to respectfully engage those who disagree with them. An ambassador is reasonable. An ambassador has informed convictions, not just feelings, but gives reasons, asks questions, aggressively seeks answers, and will not be stumped by the same challenge twice. One of the things I love about reading about Dawson Trotman and his life is he made a commitment. When somebody asked him a question he couldn't answer, he got the answer, and then he, he, he made a commitment. He will never not know that answer again. He will always remember that answer. A good ambassador is tactical. An ambassador adapts to each unique person and situation, maneuvering with wisdom to ch challenge bad thinking, presenting the truth in an understandable and compelling way. An ambassador is clear. An ambassador uses careful and clear language and doesn't rely on Christian lingo. An ambassador is fair. An ambassador is honest. An ambassador is careful with the facts and will not misrepresent another's view or overstate his own case or understate the demands of the gospel. An ambassador is humble. That's huge. An ambassador is attractive. An ambassador will act with grace, kindness, and good manners. He will not dishonor Christ in his conduct. And then an ambassador is dependent. An ambassador knows that effectiveness requires joining his best efforts with God's power, depending on the Holy Spirit. So we're called to being ambassadors for Christ. Before we pause for comments and questions, let us consider one more truth found in chapter 5, verse 21. For our sake, God made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him, in Jesus, we might become the righteousness of God. When you absorb this truth, it's truly life-changing. If you really let it sink it into your heart, you realize that not only is your salvation 100% by grace, but your sanctification is 100% by grace. And when that sinks in, gratitude towards Jesus becomes the engine of your Christian life. And it's the key to your, your transformation. Is this true? Is this true for you? Have you experienced that shift from a works-based sanctification to a grace-based sanctification or a gospel-driven sanctification? I mean, 2 Corinthians 5.21 is one of the big gold nuggets of truth in the Bible that can change your life. And if you miss it, as Paul goes on in chapter 6, you will receive God's grace in vain if you don't understand that your salvation is 100% by grace, your sanctification is 100% by grace. So the fifth principle is this, practicing or living out gospel-driven sanctification. What does that look like? Well, it looks like a diagram that Jim Reske and I show you a lot, but I think it's worth seeing a lot because I need to see it. It looks like this diagram up here. As we walk with God, we should experience a growing awareness of God's holiness, but also a growing awareness of my sinfulness at the same time. Only Jesus can save us. Only Jesus can sanctify us. Do you get that? Only Jesus can save us. I know you know that, but do you believe that only Jesus can sanctify us? The key to real, lasting, internal life change is to allow the gospel to grow bigger and bigger in our lives. And, and the main motive for us to live the Christian life is not to get rewards. It's a growing gratitude towards Jesus. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Gospel Addict Podcast. Feel free to contact us via email at gospeladdictpodcast at gmail.com. Stay tuned for our next episode and remember... On your worst days, you're never beyond the reach of God's grace. And on your best days, you're never beyond the need of God's grace. See you next time.